My name is Daryl Wanzer Serrano. I'm an associate professor of Latina Latino Studies and Communication Studies, and also the director of the Latina Latino Studies program at the University of Iowa. Um, I've written a lot about the New York Young Lords and talked a lot about them in uh, various public settings. And so I thought today, uh, on July 26, 2019, uh, since it's the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Young Lords in New York, uh, I'd create a little video uh, slideshow in order to introduce people to the organization uh, so that you can be better prepared to, uh, to, to, to see and hear and learn about uh, all the great stuff that you're going to be seeing and hearing and learning about over the course of this anniversary year. So uh, to do that, I want to begin uh, by providing a little bit of an overview of, uh, of who I am, uh, where I come from, uh, how I came to the Young Lords as a topic, um, and then get to talking about the Young Lords uh, in its specificity. I am a uh, first-generation uh, college student and a Boricua uh, from Washington State, a Puerto Rican from Washington State. Um, I did uh, debate in high school and college, which was really important to, I think, helping me succeed uh, as a college student later on. Um, and uh, today, I'm the father of two, including a micro preemie, uh, who was born at 24 weeks uh, gestation and laying less, weighing less than a pound, uh, and also uh, uh, you know a second kiddo who's uh, who's seven months old right now uh, and is just a delight. Also a father of a of a dog, a little golden doodle named Oso. Uh, to get to the point where I am now, um, I've you know gone through a lot of education. As I mentioned, I was a first generation student. Uh, and the first place I went to school um, after graduating high school was the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington, where I got my bachelor's degree in communication. Um, after that, I went on to get my master's and PhD uh, in the Department of Communication and Culture uh, with a focus in rhetoric and public culture at Indiana University in Bloomington. Um, after I got my degree, I, uh, I got my first tenure track job at the University of Georgia, uh, it was short-lived um, uh, because I went and did a postdoc at the University of Illinois uh, after one year there, uh, and then went on to the University of North Texas, where I spent the first kind of three years uh, of, of really my career, um, and then uh, now you know moving on from there to the University of Iowa, where, like I said at the beginning, I'm now a tenured associate professor of communication and uh, Latina Latino studies, and also the director of the Latina Latino studies program. Um, you know, in going through this education, I think my, uh, my, my educational, my, my kind of research trajectory is one uh, that is, of course, focused on Latina Latino studies, uh, but also from within my home discipline of communication, uh, animated by a kind of, uh, 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 an exigency, right, an imperfection marked by urgency within communication studies, which, uh, which has to do with it being so white, um, both discursively and conceptually. Uh, so the theories that gain the most traction uh, here in, in rhetorical studies oftentimes reinforce a modern Western bias, uh, shutting out the situated public discourses of people of color. And the consequences of that whiteness of the field are pretty clear, I think. Not only does the field not publish much at all regarding the voices of the dispossessed, but also people of color are not invited into the broader conversation. So the broader disciplinary point is to push the epistemic boundaries of rhetorical studies and to decenter modern Western material discourses. Doing so, I think, links up to interdisciplinary pushes to generate spaces for the voices of people of color and de-link the academy from a dangerous zero-point epistemology. Although I'm constantly engaged in various side projects addressing Latinidad, anti-blackness, and the constraints of social death and more, my heart will always be filled with work on the Young Lords. So today I want to talk about how, after hundreds of years of colonial oppression, living under the rule of two different colonial regimes from two different continents, a group of young Puerto Ricans, Chicanos, African Americans, Koreans, and more, most of whom were, your, were, were the age of, of young people, like college age folks, uh, found the resources and motivation to rise up and challenge the system that had been holding them and their parents and their parents' parents back for generations. Uh, and I talk about this at length in my book, The New York Young Lords and the Struggle for Liberation, which is, uh, you know, at this point, still the only kind of 
scholarly monograph uh, on the Young Lords that, that that does a bit of history, a kind of critical rhetorical history of the organization, um, and also does some analysis of the ways in which some of their different kind of points of activism uh, helped and en- uh, enable and enact a kind of decolonial sensibility uh, within the Puerto Rican community. So going back to this uh, to this history. You know, the inability of Puerto Ricans to take control of their economy, education, and other local institutions on the island became, uh, because of U.S. colonial policies, continued in new urban centers once they migrated. In New York City, the primary migration target from the 1920s through the 1970s, Puerto Ricans were often only marginally better off than they were on the island. While wages were higher and food was cheaper, Puerto Ricans in New York still fared worse than any other racial or ethnic group. President Johnson's Great Society social programs were eventually enacted with the intent of alleviating some of the financial pressures felt by African Americans, uh, Latinas, Latinos, and Latinx folks, and others. But for Puerto Ricans and many others, the programs were horribly inefficient and failed to elevate them out of an embedded position in the underclass. Tenements were run by landlords with with, with questionable ethics, read slumlords. Social service organizations were ruled by poverty pimps. Hospitals in poor neighborhoods were understaffed, underfunded, and in the case of Lincoln Hospital uh, in the Bronx, operated despite having been condemned by the city. Politically, the community was disparaged as docile, and professionals, so-called experts and elites, monopolized the role of political activism. By most accounts, life for the working-class Puerto Rican in El Barrio left much to be desired. Community members basically had two choices, move out or put up with it. And given the deep structures of poverty and a colonized mentality, this was a false choice. The New York Young Lords were a revolutionary, grassroots, street political organization that emerged in East Harlem in mid-1969, quickly spreading throughout the boroughs and across state lines. The Lords were a multi-ethnic organization of anywhere between hundreds and thousands of members, no one ever confirms a number, uh, who were split evenly by sex, comprised of about two-thirds Puerto Ricans and New Yorkans, a quarter other Latinx, uh, and a number of African Americans, including some, like Denise Oliver, who were involved in leadership within the organization. The Young Lords formed in response to community health, educational, environmental, and political needs, and they were guided by a revolutionary tradition that was set in motion first over 100 years ago, uh, over 100 years earlier, excuse me, with El Grito de Lares in Puerto Rico. Influenced by and working in coalition with Latin American revolutionaries, U.S. American revolutionaries, the Black Panthers, and others, the Young Lords, uh, in the words of of another scholar, centered their work on a combination of community-based empowerment and national liberation. The group shifted focus uh, and name in 1972, uh, lost a lot of its membership and support, and was defunct, even in its new form and name, by 1976, another victim of COINTEL pro-repression, uh, and to a certain degree, their own successes. So during that brief tenure from 1969 to 1976, the New York Young Lords were a revolutionary nationalist, anti-racist, anti-sexist group who advanced a complex political program featuring support for the liberation of all Puerto Ricans on the island and in the U.S., the broader liberation of all third world people, equality for women, U.S. demilitarization, leftist political education, redistributive justice, and other programs as they fit into their ecumenical ideology. Their activism took many forms. They gave speeches, held rallies, taught political education courses out of their uh, community offices, and produced a newspaper and radio program, both called Palante, that articulated their vision of democratic egalitarianism, anti-colonialism, and socialist redistribution. They started numerous community initiatives, such as the lead poisoning and tuberculosis testing programs, child care for working mothers, and meal programs for poor children. They also engaged in acts of civil disobedience, such as the garbage offensive, two separate takeovers of an East Harlem church, which they renamed the People's Church each time, sit-ins, and disruptions at a local hospital that the city had condemned. Uh, and support of acts of civil unrest sponsored by other groups like the Black Panthers and student organizations. In all, they engaged in what they believed were strategically and tactically sound actions to advance their cause and transform their people. 
operating in a colonial borderland that was mapped onto their spaces, bodies, and minds, the young lords advanced decolonial sensibilities in El Barrio and beyond. Despite being the first post-McCarthy-era radical New Yorican organization and having a street named after them in El Barrio in the summer of 2014, the discourse and activism of the young lords remains drastically understudied to this day. Unfortunately, such historical omissions are not unusual where Puerto Ricans are concerned. Written broadly, uh, 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 writing broadly about scholarly inattention to Puerto Rican movements of that era, uh, Andy Torres laments that the historical record of this experience is almost non-existent. Even within the social movements and diversity literature, we find barely a mention of the Puerto Rican contribution to the insurgency that changed the United States. In their edited volume titled The Puerto Rican Movement, Torres and Jose Velasquez uh, start filling the intellectual gaps and addressing the ways in which mainland Puerto Ricans began generating consciousness and organizational structures to mount resistance against lived oppression that had long-standing historical, political, socioeconomic, and cultural roots. The Nuevo Despertar, the new awareness of Puerto Rican radicalism that took place across U.S. communities in the 1960s, had roots in a complex mixture of a few things. One, contemporary Black, Chicano, Asian, and other third world and student activist influences. Two, a renewed sense of a history of struggle against the colonial domination of Puerto Ricans. And three, an emergent vocabulary to engage critically the intersections of race, class, gender, and nation. Central to this new awareness in New York City was the Young Lords. Notwithstanding their centrality, no scholarly book before mine has focused sustained attention on what Marta Moreno calls this group of young men and women of color who made a significant impact on history. So now I want to move on to, to kind of you know, provide uh, that more direct history of the Young Lords, beginning with their time in Chicago. So the Young Lords organization was originally a street gang turned political that originated in the Lincoln Park neighborhood of Chicago. Emerging as a gang in 1959, the Young Lords organized in response to the verbal and physical abuse Puerto Ricans were enduring at the hands of white gangs in the neighborhood. The Young Lords shifted direction in 1968 after their leader, Jose Chacha Jimenez, experienced a political conversion during a 60-day stint in Cook County Jail on drug charges. While jailed, Jimenez was befriended by a black Muslim librarian and began reading widely, most importantly, the works of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. He also began learning about the Black Panther Party and, according to a recent interview, thought he could do, quote, something similar to what blacks were doing but within the Puerto Rican community, end quote. By the fall of 1968, Jimenez reorganized and renamed the group uh, as the Young Lords Organization, instigating a concomitant shift in, in focus away from gang dealings and socialization and toward more revolutionary ideals and activism. As the newly reformated, reformulated Young Lords organization, the group began focusing largely on issues of urban renewal, poverty, and police brutality. By 1969, they were operating in coalition with the Chicago chapter of the Black Panthers under the leadership then of Fred Hampton, who was remarkably influential to Jimenez. Uh, so in coalition with them and the Young Patriots, a group of white leftists, which constituted the original Rainbow Coalition. According to an editorial published in the first issue of their YLO newspaper, dated uh, March 19, 1969, the organization wanted, quote, a new society in which all people are treated as equal, a society whose wealth is controlled and shared by all its members and not by a few, a society in which men and women view other members as brothers and sisters, and not as people to be exploited and hated, end quote. The editorial went on to denounce police brutality, advocate for a living wage, demand community control of institutions and land, and condemn all forms of colonialism, featuring various programs uh, organized around an insistence on self-determination. The YLO led numerous campaigns and takeovers, ran a breakfast program for children, addressed important health care needs, and fought gentrification. At one point or another, the YLO had branches in New York, where they published the Palante newsplay paper and split from Chicago to form the Young Lords Party. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, also in Milwaukee, where they published a newspaper called El Young Lord, uh, beginning in, in April 1971, uh, in California and throughout the Northeast. Faced with constant police repression, disorganization, and lack of resources, 
the Chicago YLO was largely defunct by 1972. So uh, the first phase of organization for the New York Young Lords uh, began, uh, you know, kind of before this point, but you know, they, they were founded as an organization uh, July 26th, 1969. Um, in New York, uh, they, uh, you know, they, they started this branch. There's kind of a long history of kind of how they came to the idea of kind of opening a chapter of the Young Lords uh, in New York City. Um, I talk about that, that story in my book, and I'm sure uh, lots of folks will be recounting that story uh, during this 50th anniversary year. Um, uh, but they'd been gathering and, and discussing, you know, Puerto Rican history and politics and um, and, you know, looking for ways to kind of like take things to the next level and get involved and be engaged in kind of direct political action uh, in the streets of New York. Uh, and so, you know, when they, when they founded, when, when they kind of opened up this chapter in New York City, uh, they had been doing a bunch of uh, work around sanitation, around garbage. Uh, which was, you know, truly an environmental justice issue, uh, and one that was uh, that was deeply felt, like on a physical level, uh, by everyone living in East Harlem. Uh, you know, the garbage offensive began with them uh, really just going around and picking up trash uh, and introducing themselves to uh, to folks in the neighborhood who didn't know them. Uh, and getting them involved in the pr in, in the process of kind of taking back the physical space of the community, um, and uh, that reached a kind of you know kind of peak shortly after they declared themselves as the Young Lords uh, fifty years ago. Again today, when I'm recording this, um, uh, you know, once they got going, they engaged in uh, in other acts of. Uh, of kind of organization and disobedience uh, within the local community. So following the garbage offensive, which was a protracted operation that lasted uh, you know, a number of weeks uh, and had numerous confrontations with, uh, with police and others, uh, they, uh, they engaged in, uh, in other forms of direct action around health, uh, principally uh, around the issues of tuberculosis. Uh, there was a, a pretty significant tuberculosis problem in the community. Uh, but a lot of people didn't know that they were being affected by it uh, because they didn't have access to very good health care and the kinds of testing that's necessary in order to determine whether you have the disease. Uh, and so they liberated a tuberculosis testing truck, an x-ray truck, uh, and brought it into their community uh, in order to be able to, to, to give people the tests uh, to be able to determine whether they needed to seek additional treatment. Uh, they also uh, started the first uh, the first really you know, successful door-to-door -door lead poisoning testing program. Uh, you know, lead was a common ingredient in paints that were used uh, at that time. You know, we don't we don't think about that as much of a problem today, unless you're like buying a really old house or something like that. Uh, and we don't have to think of it as as a big of as big of a problem because of uh, the activism of the young lords who uh, who took these testing kits that the city had stockpiled and, uh, and weren't distributing and weren't using uh, and went door to door with medical students, uh, testing people and figuring out, right, whether they were being exposed, you know, especially young kids were being exposed to uh, lead and being poisoned by it. Um, you know, by the end of 1969, um, they'd, uh, they'd instituted other uh, programs around uh, community education um, and started doing other things uh, in coalition with other community organizations and institutions. Um, and that led them to the kind of last big action of 1969, which was the takeover of the first Spanish Methodist church in East Harlem and, re and its renaming as the People's Church. Uh, that church offensive, which I also write about in uh, in my book, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically turned that uh, that visible institution, uh, kind of right in the heart of East Harlem, uh, into a place of sanctuary uh, for uh, for you know for people for Puerto Ricans who were gaining in this political consciousness. Uh, they ran a daycare program out of out of the church. They ran a breakfast program out of the church. They held arts events like the one we just saw out of the church, um, and really like you know like like 
underscored their commitment uh, to kind of self-determination and community control. Uh, also during this first phase, they engaged in the Lincoln Hospital uh, takeover, which I talked about very briefly earlier. Uh, this was a hospital that had been condemned by the city uh, and you know, should have been closed. Uh, but of course, black and brown folks were being treated in it uh, in a subpar way. Um, that reached, uh, you know, that kind of reached a kind of peak uh, when uh, when one young woman was uh, was killed during a kind of botched abortion. Uh, where the doctors didn't have, uh, didn't take an appropriate medical history, uh, and gave her medication that that killed her, um, and you know that issue of health in general, but reproductive health in particular, uh, was pretty important to the Young Lords organization. So, in May of 1970, uh, the organization has a kind of shift in focus and name. So. They moved from from being the Young Lords organization to becoming the Young Lords Party. Um, this phase of the organization is marked by uh, by a period of expansion. They open up even more new branches um, uh, outside of uh, of New York, outside of the five boroughs, um, and they also uh, uh, kind of form additional coalitions uh, with other organizations. Um, they take on a kind of union structure within the organization. Uh, and so, you know, kind of sub-organizational bodies like the Women's Caucus become the Women's Union. Um, they, they really take on the issue of gender uh, uh, equity and equality within the organization. Uh, they start taking up, uh, they start more seriously taking up LGBT uh, issues uh, and operate in coalition with like, uh, the Street Transvestites Against Racism, uh, The Star, which was a, an organization led by Sylvia Rivera, uh, and also work with Gay Liberation Front. Um, and this period, this phase also marks an expansion uh, to Puerto Rico where they opened up two branches. Uh, and then eventually by the end of this phase, a kind of contraction where they closed those branches on the island. Um, so this was definitely a, a, a period of growth where they continued their serve the people programs, continued uh, their educational programs, uh, and really like had a strong presence within the communities uh, where they operated. Uh, phase three of the organization uh, was was met with with kind of more significant changes. Uh, there were changes in leadership that happened around this time. Um, and a, a pretty significant shift in the organization that included this, this pretty drastic renaming from Young Lords Party to the Puerto Rican Revolutionary Workers Organization. Um, this happened in July 1972 um, and continued through sometime in 1976. It's kind of hard to pinpoint the exact date um, of the organization's demise. Um, certainly during this period, membership uh, shrank pretty dramatically, um, and uh, and a lot of the kind of direct serve the people type programs um, went under. Um, offices were closed, uh, and the, the organization kind of shifted to, to a, a greater focus on unionizing workers in their places of employment. Um, and so, you know, to, to, to me, the, the, this third phase um, is such a dramatic shift um, that you know it's that I tend to think about the young lords as the first two phases uh, when they were actually called the young lords. Um, you know, one of the things that kind of and I wish I, I should have done a slide for this that, that visually represents this shift in focus is in the kinds of the kinds of iconography that they used as an organization, the the images that they used that they displayed on signs and. and and stuff. Uh, in the first two phases, right, it was pretty, um, they had a pretty broad spectrum that they, visual spectrum that they drew from. Um, they were, you know, drawing uh, from kind of key images of Puerto Rican nationalist and revolutionary politics and Cuban, nas Cuban revolutionary politics and Latin American revolutionary politics. Um, while still kind of engaging, uh, uh, kind of the scholarship and the figures of socialism and communism. Um, and in this last phase, they published the speeches and re resolutions of the, 
uh, of the of the of the the first party Congress, I believe it was called, and the cover of that includes uh, pictures of none of those people that I just mentioned. It includes pictures of Marx, uh, Lenin, I believe Engels, uh, Mao, and one other person. Um, all kind of key figures in uh, international communist politics. Uh, and that was, you know, that shift uh, to me is kind of, you know, the point at which the the Young Lords moves from being so, what I called before, ecumenical in their ideology. Uh, they, were, they drew from so many different political traditions and histories uh, in order to uh, to kind of like, make sense out of the situations that people were experiencing on a daily basis. Uh, they moved from that that flexibility to something that was, I think, ideologically a little bit more rigid. Um, and, I th- and, and I think that's part of the reason why uh, kind of support for the organization um, and membership of the organization started to dwindle once we, we enter this, this final phase. So, uh, you know, if, if I was giving this as a talk in person, uh, this would be the time uh, to that I that I ask if there's any questions. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the comments below. Uh, also, be sure that you uh, that you check out the events happening in New York City uh, today. Uh, again, July 26th, uh, 2019 is uh, a big event um, uh, at the uh, at the Schomburg uh, that will be. That will be live streamed, and so I'll put a link to the live stream uh, in the comments below. Uh, and I hope that you will watch along and hear from people who were uh, involved uh, in the Young Lords organization for uh, you know, especially in the early years and for quite a long time. So thanks for watching. I hope this has been helpful, and um, that's it. <laughs>